Alright guys, let's get this uh, presentation started. This is part of our uh, Lunch and Learn series. Uh, some of you would have gotten uh, an email or a letter inviting you to this. It was great to have uh, over 130 people participate uh, as far as this presentation goes. Uh, it's, one of, it's part of our Lunch and Learn series that we do that we put on free for people. Uh, it's a great time. And so we're going to jump in. As always, um, you know, if, if I give an introduction, introduction to myself, my name is David Zarling. Uh, I'm a chartered market technician. I'm also the head of investment strategy and research at Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. For us, we use the Adaptive Investment Management System to manage assets for our clients as part of our true holistic process. As always, presentation for those of you viewing this, uh, if we don't know you, it should be consumed as informational education, educational purposes only. Uh, don't, don't look at this as something that you make your uh, investment decisions on. And if you need further legal restrictions in term of use, there's a website here that you can check out. But let's jump in. Uh, what we're going to cover on this video, 2020, so far, uh, a wild ride for sure. We're going to talk about which political party is better for the market, right? That's the topic du jour. We're only a few days away. And so we're going to cover that. We're going to look at what insight the market can give us regarding presidential elections. I think you're going to find that really insightful. Then we're going to do a Q&A panel with myself and Ian. Uh, Paul's going to host that, and I think you guys are going to enjoy that too. And then we'll do some housekeeping and final thoughts. So jumping right into it, as I mentioned, uh, 2020, definitely uh, like riding a, a bucking Bronco. Uh, a lot of history made this year. You know, when we look back on 2020, of course, as individuals, we're going to look at, uh, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic. We're going to look at the ramifications of that, whether it was economically, uh, whether it was within our families, uh, in our churches, in our businesses, etc., it had an impact. It had an impact on markets, and uh, markets have had, had a, a tumultuous ride, to say the least. As an example, here's a chart here from uh, Bank of America Global Research, just showing that the February-March 2020 sell-off, 30%. It was the fastest 30% drawdown in history, um, and it's right up there with uh, periods like 1929, uh, 1934. Uh, there's some historical -ness to this. They're going to write books. They're going to write um, curriculum off of the 2020 February-March pandemic crash, no doubt about it. And just to give you some context of what that uh, move from February and March looked like, this is the S&P 500. If you're not familiar with that, that's okay. Uh, the most famous one they talk about on the radio, TV, internet is the Dow Jones. Uh, that has 30 stocks in it. This is the S&P 500. It has 500 stocks in it. And in orange boxes here, I've highlighted 20% corrections in this market. And so back here, you know, in uh, 2018, this was a period of time that it took three months to have a 20% correction. Uh, back in February, March, it was about eight days that was 20%, and actually it fell further than that. Uh, but just like giving that context, another way to view that is to view the 2020 correction related to the 2018 correction and just the duration of time, how fast it was to drop 20%. Um, pretty significant amount of time uh, difference between the two. Uh, for sure, a crash-type environment. This highlights what it looked like versus other periods of crash data going back uh, even further than the 1929 back to 1927. This is what each each of those corrections look like using um, some uh, decile rankings. You can just see how much of an outlier it is. It was that fast. This, the way I describe this is uh, we're not that far removed from the 33-year anniversary of the 1987 market crash, uh, which actually had a 20% crash in one day. Uh, but prior to that, the market had already down, been down preceding that, so it actually had a bigger, uh, um, this, it, my point being that 2020 is like 1987, except faster. Um, it is our 1987, and we're, I'm proud of uh, my team, the adaptive team, and how we handled this uh, situation. One of the main features of the adaptive system is protecting from drawdowns, and uh, we were aggressive in that manner uh, during this period of time. And so the, I know that's something our clients appreciated, um, and that's something that I'm proud of our team for acting on. But definitely here highlighting how quick of a move it was, how historic it was. Um, it was minus 35% in 23 trading days. Um, that's extremely fast in a market. I've provided here some of our returns uh, during that period of time. Um, again, 
this is going to vary. The returns are going to vary depending on distribution contributions. Um, and so our most aggressive model, ultra growth, uh, is extremely aggressive. It was minus 18 percent. Growth was minus 14 percent. So we're really cutting that drawdown by by more than half. And, and the way I can say the, the reason why I can say that is you'd say, oh, well, 14's kind of half of 35 percent. But really, when we look at drawdowns, you know, minus 35 percent, it takes 53 percent to get back to even. Whereas a minus 14% takes around 17% to get back to even. So we're, we're well more than cutting that drawdown in half. Uh, proud of my team for that. Proud of the way the adaptive system performed in that in market environment. Now we know uh, from history that the market did come back. Um, and that's good. And that, that's something we like. Uh, but we also like the fact, the fact that adaptive was able to protect in this environment. Because uh, nothing said that the, the market had to come back. But it was 23 trading days, minus 35%. Um, Russell 2000, uh, even worse. This is a basket of small capitalized stocks, minus 43% in 23 trading days. Another way to look at this is if we were to look at the entire world of stocks and subtract out the U.S. So I already kind of talked about some U.S. stocks, whether the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. If you take the remainder of the world, basically stocks, in 23 days, wiped out 10 years of gains. Uh, a pretty incredible time period. Like I said, it's historical. It's something that'll be written about. This is what 2020 looked like comparatively to some other uh, incredible periods, whether we're even talking about uh, 2007, 2008, back in here, that correction, the great financial crisis, 1987, 1929, 2020, uh, definitely one. Uh, that we're going to be looking back on and acknowledging as being historic. Now, what's also interesting is that when we look at, right, because we're market historians, right, we're not, we're not just blindly focused on the now. Uh, we focus on the now, but we're also market historians, and we understand that when we look at length of bear market now, the industry likes to define a bear market as minus 20% or greater. For whatever reason, they, they pick that number. I can't give you a reason why. But if we use that number and we say, you know, what, what did it look like? How long did it take to get minus 20% uh, or more? And then what it looked like to recover from that. And so, you know, for example, 1987, uh, here in the middle of the chart, took four months to be minus 34%. Okay, for comparison purposes, here's February, March 2020. So one month to get minus 34%. So like I said, it's like 1987, but accelerated in time. And so... In 1987, uh, minus 34% uh, in four months. It took 20 months to get back to uh, a length of recovery. We ba basically got back to even August and September uh, 2020, so about five months to recover that. So at a tremendous whipsaw, if you will, uh, of a 34% correction and then a return back to the highs, uh, one of the quickest on record. And again, a bucking Bronco for sure. Also proud of the way our team was able to scale back in during this period. Uh, obviously not able to capture the bottom. We don't know what's a bottom until afterwards. Um, that would be hindsight bias if we thought we knew where the bottom was. Uh, but this just goes to show how historic, how a wild ride 2020 has been and continues to be. Um, you know, since the bottom, this chart here is from Macro Charts. It, it's, it does a good job explaining, you know, many people understand that the market trades during the day. Uh, perfectly normal. And it also trades after hours, also perfectly normal. And many people don't realize that there's an after hours trading session. And this, what this chart shows is that off the bottom, the returns off the bottom from March have ba basically been in the after hours session. What that means is that you have a lot of gapping, meaning the price uh, the, the next day is higher than the closing price the day prior. And if you were to enter into a new trade during the day, most likely that position was a loss during the day and you had to hold overnight to have some type of gain. And so a very tough environment, uh, meaning uh, to have most of the return not happening during the day, that it's happening overnight, uh, definitely a unique uh, uh, situation. Uh, of course, there's no such thing as normal markets. Uh, so I, I don't get to sit here and say this is abnormal. All I'm going to say is it's unique as far as the majority of the returns off the March bottom coming in the after hours session. This shows, this chart shows that 2020 is on track for the eighth most volatile year ever. Uh, this is measuring the quantity of trading days that has a move of 1% per cent 
or more. That could be the upside or downside. And we're well on our way to tracking uh, a top 10 most follow the year. In fact, October's increased this number uh, uh, quite a bit. And so uh, it looks like we're on track to, to have a top 10 most follow the year ever recorded. And it's in good company, you know, whether we're talking about 2008, 2009, whether we're talking about the, the Great Depression back in 1929, uh, this is a significant year to say the least. Uh, I also like driving home, just like what's the big picture perspective, right? When, when I talk about this wild ride, right, we talked about the correction back in uh, 2018 and the correction back in February, March and the fastest recovery uh, that we've seen in, in a long time, one of the fastest ever. Uh, may, no, actually the fastest ever recovery. This is the All World Index. This is uh, measuring, I, I believe it's over 8,000 constituents, measuring all the stocks in, in, in the world uh, or the majority of them. And um, here we see a nice trend in, at the end of 2016, all of 2017, uh, January 24, 2018, something changed here. Uh, from that point forward, stocks globally basically up and actually prices, it's as of this recording, we're actually down in this level here, the 78, 79, so we're actually negative since January 2018. Uh, when I put this presentation together, we were positive 3.3. Either way you want to look at it, whether we're here in negative or positive 3.3, we've basically gone nowhere for over three years with two uh, major corrections in between. Um, when we look back at history, we know that we have a 20% correction about once every four and a half to five years. We've had two of those in a matter of almost three years. So, uh, you know, one of the in the invitation I sent out, one of the questions I said we we're going to talk about is what's a stealth bear market? This is a stealth bear market. And what I mean by that is three years, almost three years sideways with so much heartburn in between, uh, with two major corrections. If you think about that, if you are a buy and hold investor, which we're not at adaptive, but if you're a buy and hold investor, you took on 22% risk, 35% risk, just to basically break even. Uh, not really a great scenario uh, on your side if you're a buy and hold investor. That's why we manage adaptively, because when you're near in retirement, that's an important aspect of your process is to be able to protect your nest egg, what you've been able to accumulate over time. All right, just touching base on you know the topic du jour, a couple days to go, and we've got the presidential election. Of course, we also have the Senate and House up for uh, up up in the air as far as what's going to happen there. And so a lot of people, right, are attaching their minds and their biases to the election outcome and how the stock market's going to perform. What I need people to realize, though, is that that goes back to our biases. I'm not saying that voting's not important. We think voting's tremendously important. You should vote on your principles and your values and vote for the, the, the person and the, and the individuals that represent that. At the same time, having an understanding that just because you vote for that individual doesn't um, guarantee some type of outcome for the market. You might have your favorite individual that you're voting for, and in your mind, you think if I vote for that person, the uh, there's going to be some type of correlation with market outcome if I vote for that person. Not necessarily. Um, you could vote for your least, fa you know, uh, uh, or your least favorite candidate could win, and the market could rise, or you vote for your favorite candidate and the market drops. You have to be open to all outcomes, and that's and we are at a, at adaptive. So one of the things I would just want to highlight is which party is better, right? We're we're predominantly a two party system in in America at this time. Doesn't always have to be that way. Uh, there is a third party on the ballot, but at this time, the the, the majority uh, vote either Republican or Democrat. And so here's a chart that goes back to like the late eighteen second half of eighteen hundreds just showing the annualized return between a, a Democrat and Republican president. And it's basically break even. Um, and so there's no uh, presidential party that has a monopoly on market returns. When we, you know, this is another way to view that chart as far as different presidents and, and where returns were, uh, whether it was a Democrat or Republican. Again, nothing significant noticed during that period of time. How about when someone uh, has power or control of the House or the Senate, what does that look like? So not just looking at presidential outcomes, but also looking at what is the House of Representatives uh, and, and, you know, what does the Senate look like? It's it's a wash. It's it's flip a coin, you know, when there's Democrats in control, whether there's Republicans in control, annualized returns going back in time, it does not, it's not something that matters. 
Um, it matters from a standpoint of vote your principles, vote your values. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that presidential uh, policies or party policies don't have an impact on, on markets. They do. Uh, but the way it shows itself is not cut and dry. It's, they're not guarantee as far as one party or the other when you're voting for them. So that touches base on that. One thing we do know when we look at election year seasonality, okay, here in Wisconsin, we have our seasons. One of the, one of the things I love about Wisconsin is we get full seasons of each, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. We get to experience them all, and I love it. Um, you know, some areas of the country are not so fortunate to have a, a bunch of seasons, but at the same time, I'm sure there's people that enjoy that aspect of where they live as well. But for us in Wisconsin, one of the things I love is we have seasonality. Markets have seasonality too. Um, for example, here's the S&P 500 performance during election year. This goes back to 1950, basically the inception. Um, 19, the S&P 500 was launched in, I think, like 1957. Uh, there was an S&P 90 before that. Point being that, you know, mid-September going into November are typically weak in an election year. Uh, we, we like to study that information because if, if, if stocks are strong during this period, uh, that's where we want to pay attention. We don't use seasonality of markets to predict the future. Um, we're not in the prediction game. We're into the observing the evidence before us. And, and what we would notice is if October wasn't weak or September and October weren't weak, that would be notable too. And in fact, when we look at up for re-election years, so there's election years and there's up for re-election years. We're in an up for re-election year. Typically, the weakness is not too, too bad um, when you're looking at the September, October period. And so that's to be determined where, you know, we're bumping up to the end of October here. Uh, we have seen a, a bit of weakness. So we actually look a little bit more like we do here on this bottom chart, uh, perfectly normal. Um, so, so nothing necessarily sticking out there other than we're showing to be more of a election year type uh, seasonality rather than an up for re-election type seasonality. The other thing to note is October is typically very strong. When we look at since 1950, the past 20 years, past 10 years, October is one of the best performing months uh, on record. Um, and with the exception being election years. In election years, October tends to be down. And we're not. it looks like we're not going to see the exception to the rule here. It looks like October is going to be down uh, for 2020, an election year, uh, perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable. I'm not saying that we don't want stocks to go up. I'm just saying that from a seasonal perspective, uh, it's fitting that mold. Here's a chart that talks about uh, quarterly returns based on a four-year presidential cycle. This one takes a little bit to get your eyes acclimated to. Uh, what I want to point you to is, you know, we've got year one uh, over here on the left side represented by four quarters, year two, year three, and what's boxed in here is year four, which is the year we're in. And we're heading in where we are in the fourth quarter of year four. And typically, that's one of the higher percentage return quarters. Uh, and what I mean by that is probably or, or the amount of times that the fourth quarter in year four of a presidential term is up is is north of 80 percent uh the only other better time period is year the quarter one of year three um so 80 percent of the time we're seeing a positive return in the market in year four uh averaging around two percent so we're open to the idea that quarter four uh is something that could see in the fourth year of a four-year term of a president could see a positive return in you know what can the market provide any type of insight into you know what's the outcome of the presidential election maybe one thing that this chart shows is that when we compare the three months leading up to an election versus uh the the income incumbent party the way to think about it is if stocks are up three months heading into the election that tends to be a good thing for the incumbent party. So if stocks are up three months prior to the election, incumbent party tends to win. If stocks are down three months prior to the election, tends to be good for the challenging party, right? This is a hit rate of 20 out of 23 years. Um, so the data is a little bit behind on here. Election day is November 3rd, 2020. We're actually about even. So this says 7.3%, but that's back from October 12th. The market's corrected 
So we're about even. So it's kind of a toss-up. Uh, so whether this data will be right or wrong will will dictate will be dictated based on what does uh, the price look like three months prior to November third, and then which party wins. But we do know upwards of ninety percent of the time uh, that scenario markets up three months prior, incumbent wins. Stocks down three months prior, challenging party wins. So we'll see. We'll see what November third brings. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if that data holds uh, significant going into that election. So now we're going to do a Q&A with myself. Uh, Paul's going to moderate. Ian's joining us. He's part of the adaptive team. I think you guys are going to re really enjoy this segment. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Paul Zarling, a managing partner at Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. And it's my privilege to have a question and answer panel with uh, Dave Zarling at CMT and also uh, Ian McMillan at CMT. And there's only 3,000 of those in the world, and we're excited that uh, they both are with us. And so I want to do a couple questions. I know Dave, you've led up on a couple of nice slides here. Um, and, and I want to kick it off with the election. The election's only you know, less than a week away now by the time we're recording this. And I know you guys have talked it, uh, about it on the podcast and even on the last two market updates we've done. I really would love to, uh, for you to walk us through your thoughts uh, leading up to the election here, which is under a week. Sure. Um, you know, if I if I can share some of those slides, I just think it's uh, fascinating how the sentiment going into the election is very similar uh, to 2016, whether we're looking at magazine covers or what uh, polls are predicting, quote unquote, expert polls. Uh, you know, in 2016, you know, I know uh, Ian, Ian's brought up in the fact what some of the sentiment was back then, uh, you know, it's just seeing polls showing huge leadership for uh, Biden going into the election. Same thing was happening with Hillary Clinton. Um, that doesn't mean that Biden can't win, but it's just interesting to see this sentiment, the same one uh, taking place now uh, from the media, uh, from quote unquote experts. And so we're gonna see, we're gonna see what's gonna happen. And for us, we really don't use that information necessarily for um, our investment process. When, when we're adaptive, we have a game plan, you know, for us, using something like the S&P 500, below 3,400, we're gonna reduce exposure below 3,200. We don't really want anything to do with equities. Um, and it's really quite that simple. And that's our process. That's what we wanna focus on is our process. We don't wanna get caught up in polls. Uh, we don't wanna get caught up in um, necessarily the sentiment. We wanna be aware of sentiment, media sentiment, but mm -hmm. we're open to the idea that either candidate can win and the market can do the opposite of what you're thinking. So you may have a favorite candidate and that's great. Vote for that candidate. But many of us have a bias where we view, you know, a certain person's going to win and a certain thing is going to happen to the market for us above 3,400. Great. Below that, we're going to reduce and below 3,200. We want nothing to do with equities. So that's our game plan. All right, Ian, this question's for you. I want to pivot a little bit from the election. I want to move on to interest rates. Uh, which have been falling for four years. The you know, mortgage rates are low. You know, we've talked uh, earlier about refis and the volume there, even a little small uh, residential boom, uh, housing boom there. Um, just for everyone watching, Ian, you know, how do we get here? Are we going to see lower rates? What does it mean for the stock market, if anything? Uh, so yeah, Dave shows a great chart here to the left that show interest rates kind of moving these three decades, I think it's a little bit longer than that, 33 or 34 years. How do we get here? Uh, obviously, I mean, rates have been going down for almost four decades at this point. Uh, they've been going down my entire career, I guess Dave's as well. Uh, and I've constantly heard, you know, when will rates go higher? Uh, we know that at least short term, above 1.6% on the 30 year treasury that we have the potential to go higher. We'll see if that comes to fruition. There's been a little bit of uh, a rally there recently in interest rates, but as we know, still extremely historically low. Uh, moving on to your point, it did, it has kind of led to this small Residential housing boom, which has been very, very evident in those areas of the, of the stock market. So not just home builders, but 
construction and anything that really goes into a house, whether it's wood flooring or drywall or paint or cabinetry, appliances, uh, asphalt, uh, you know, sewage, draining, piping, anything that you can think of. A lot of those companies are publicly traded and um, you see the you see it in the stock price. This is an area that's moving. So there's been a lot of interest there. Now we'll see if it continues. Um, there's been lots of small to intermediate term rallies in rates over the last few years. So nothing definitive yet um, that's giving us an out a, a longer term outlook of yes over the next multiple years, even decades. That we think the trend will change. Got it. Yeah, and I think I don't think the thing I would add to that is you know uh, the way we work at Adaptive is it's very simple, right? Uh, a rate above 1.6 leads to further evidence that we could have rising rates in our hands. Below 1.6, that's a different story, um, and so that's the way we think about it. Could rates go higher? Absolutely. They would have to do so mathematically. They'd have to go through the 1.6 level and hold it, sustain it, and be above it. So that's the way we think about it, and. We're also aware of it because, you know, I think Ian alluded to the fact that basically for many people listening or watching, their investment life has been in an environment where rates have fallen. So since the early 80s, rates have fallen, which means bonds have appreciated, which been, has been a beneficial to the 60-40 portfolio. We're fully aware that when that story changes, and it will change because mm -hmm. rates trend, they do yep. cycle. Um, can't tell you when exactly above 1.6 is a good start, but it doesn't have to stay there. But if we start to see interest rates rise, it does have ramifications for the 60-40 portfolio. And we're aware of that. And we keep that in mind for our, uh, for our clients. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point to bring up. And, and um, you know, related to that, but, you know, in 2020, Dave, we, you know, we had a roller coaster. We still are having a roller coaster. But not all of areas of the market perform the same. In fact, we've had some wide discrepancy uh, between the West, uh, best performing and worst performing. Um, can you, can you give us some insight into that, you know, dispersion and, you know, what's all going on and, and how we should look at that and view that? Sure. Um, dispersion is just a fancy word. Uh, it just means what's the difference between, you know, your best performing sector and uh, your best performing sector and your worst per, uh, performing sector. And so you, you know, for us, what I, what I want to highlight a little bit is just the environment that we're in the letter we sent out or the email we sent out to people inviting them to this education event. Basically one of the questions that we're going to answer during this was what is a stealth bear, bear market, a uh, bear market. The slide I have up right here uh, showing the entire world stocks. Um, basically we've gone two, almost three years with 3.3% appreciation, but we've had two 20% drawdowns in between. That's a unique environment. Um, that's a lot of risk taking to obtain that 3.3% if you're a buy and hold investor. Uh, we are not. And it's notable that to have two drawdowns like that in almost a three year period, uh, typically we have a 20% drawdown once every four and a half to five years. And so to have two of those and one quite dramatic back in February and March is a unique time. And so um, that's, that's one thing I'd like to highlight. The second thing that you talked about dispersion is we have this um, massive difference between a sector like technology, which is the best performing sector and energy, which is one of the worst performing sectors. And it is, it's a huge dispersion. And so this difference between the two, it can resolve in a couple different ways. Technology can uh, close the gap downwards towards energy or energy can catch up towards uh, technology. We don't know when that's gonna change. Uh, it doesn't have to be a change because that's a trend too, this dispersion has been a trend that's going on basically uh, for a long time, you could argue since 2015, 2016, and it's just uh, accelerated uh, this year during the correction. So um, we can see some of that, you know, whether we're looking at, when we talk about the stealth bear market, you know, this is just showing different areas of performance since the uh, January uh, 2018 top. Uh, I have it highlighted here in a blue circle. You can tell something changed there. Uh, as far as bonds go, uh, they have held up okay in some areas. Not all bonds are the same. Uh, treasuries overall since that uh, point in time uh, performed the best, but we're now seeing those break down. In addition, we had tremendous volatility back in February, March, where everything was getting sold. So whether it was a stock, a bond, or commodity, 
whatever people could get their hands on back in February, March, they sold it. Uh, dispersion, going back to that, this kind of shows that we're at the widest gap between the top and bottom sectors uh, in percentage points since the year 2000. You know, as, he, as Ian would say, oh my goodness, you know, that, that should scare people, right? You know, and he's being facetious and joking. Um, really what he's, what he's saying is like a lot of times when you bring up data and then you associate it with a year, that all of a sudden that should make things scary, right? You know, Ian, like people do it all the time. They bring up data that's from 2008 and immediately like, oh, that's bad, right? 2008. All it means is there's dispersion and you have to know what's in your portfolio. And that's what we do for our clients. Are we owning energy right now? Absolutely not. Are we, are we tilted towards tech? Yes. That has to do with that's mm -hmm. the trend, right? That's the dispersion. A dispersion is a trend too. And that's what we see right now. That will narrow sometime and we'll be able to use our adaptive process to see when that is. Yeah. Good points to bring up. Uh, one thing I also want to follow up with is, you know, back in June, you guys talked about breakaway momentum and uh, expansion of breadth. Uh, maybe just, you know, what is breadth expansion and, and what is the significance with what's going on now? So breadth is really just the number of stocks um, in the U.S. equity universe or any universe uh, could be an index, could be the entire New York Stock Exchange, uh, could be an ETF. So relative in those terms, but really it's the number of stocks in a basket of stocks that are, perform um, you know, moving to the upside. So we hear a lot about and have heard a lot about FANG and the market's only moving because of, you know, these five stocks or six stocks, if you want to have, if you want to add Microsoft in there. Mm -hmm. And while that's true, that's also how most bull markets work. And, you know, back in 03 to 08, it was companies like JP Morgan and Exxon and, materials other you know industrial type companies that were leading the market and they were heavily weighted in the s p and this time it's been tech so no real difference there other than a change of tickers and in regards to breadth expansion what we kindly finally saw was small caps beginning to participate so that's what we want to see the s p the dow the nasdaq we know that they're for the most part fine Still a lot of weakness out of small caps in the Russell 2000, which is, as we've mentioned multiple times at Lunch and Learns or on the podcast, these are the banks. And that gets us back to our rate question, and we don't have to dive back into that now. But to see small caps go higher, you'll have to see banks go higher. For banks to go higher, uh, most likely have to see rates go higher, or at least for banks to outperform would have to see rates go higher. So we have seen it. I would say for all intents and purposes, it's a pretty healthy market in regards to participation. I've seen worse. <laughs> uh, so they want to follow up on that participation. Uh, you know, past performance doesn't guarantee future results, uh, but we do know markets have seasonality. You covered that uh, you know, really well in, early in the presentation. But I know you got a chart here uh, about quarter three performance versus quarter four performance. You know, can you bring that up and maybe touch base on you know what you're seeing on your screen? Yeah, this is a a, a chart that uh, actually Ryan Dietrich uh, from LPL put together, and it just shows that um, when we have a strong uh, quarterly gain in the third quarter, it, it tends to be, um, you know, carry on into the fourth quarter. It's not a guarantee, like you said, um, but in 2020. You know, we had an, a return, a quarterly gain in the third quarter, about eight and a half percent. And prior quarters were when we were greater than uh, seven and a half, the, the fourth quarter had a positive return 100 percent of the time and had an average return somewhere between seven, eight percent. Is that a guarantee to happen? Uh, no, absolutely not. But we pay attention to seasonality and momentum. Uh, we know that in election year, uh, there's volatility going into the election. We understand that. Uh, October in election year tends to be the weakest. Uh, we're seeing some of that uh, manifest, manifest itself in the late part of October here. Um, but we'll see where we are at the end of the fourth quarter. Um, but using seasonality, it, it does seem to point to fourth quarter returns. We'll see. Uh, price is going to dictate that. You know, we kind of talked about our game plan already. Uh, so while it's, it's, it's nice to have a 
some seasonal information like that, what we're really doing is paying attention to how price actually performs. Um, it'd be a little bit like watching, you know, if it's summer out and it starts to snow, we'd want to sit up and take notice. Same thing in the market. If we're in a, entering a seasonally strong period, such as November and December and January, but we're seeing stock weakness, that would be information that we want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, final question, um, something you want people to take notice of. I'll give a couple of topics, but you can pick whichever one you want. Um, there's the dollar, there's copper, treasuries, international stocks, uh, COVID election. We already kind of talked about it, but if you want to go back to that, you can, or China. Uh, so anything you want uh, to take people to take notice of. And uh, Ian, I'll let you go first, then Dave uh, after that. And then uh, I'll come back around and close close up our Q and A panel. So, Ian, any topic on on those uh, six or seven uh, which you want people to take notice of? Uh, so I'm I'm gonna take I'm gonna take one topic, but might be killing three birds here with that sense. So I'll say the dollar dollar weakness is something we've seen over the last. Uh, I mean, few months or the last month, it's gotten more dramatic. We had a bounce, um, but longer term, or at least the intermediate term trend now seems to be down. Um, so, what you would expect by this again, copper um, and those types of metals, both base and precious. So, gold and theoretically, you would see those outperform. Gold has been very, or copper has been very strong recently. Um, this bodes well for like Latin American companies or Latin American countries and, um, and, and, you know, broad, broader emerging market strength. And I would say that a lot of that will come from China as well. It's 40% of emerging markets. China is an area we've invested in before for clients, it's an area we will invest in in the future should price dictate those actions. But uh, a lot of, you know, odd headlines out there over the years on, you know, is China safe to invest in? Uh, yeah, it is. But honestly, I think interesting strength coming out of that area uh, in the next two to three months. All right. Thank you, Ian. And Dave, what's uh, what's your take? Um, no, I I I appreciate Ian's insight there. As far as uh, the dollar weakness that we're seeing, it's it's a little bit hard to get overly bearish equities if if copper is doing well, um, and it has. And uh, we're open to the idea that a certain person could get elected, and Chinese equities are going to do just fine, because that's what price is showing the relative strength there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another development in that area, if you want to talk about the dollar, you know, we've covered cryptocurrencies on here in the past. And uh, one area we're seeing is uh, such as things as Bitcoin and Ethereum catching a bid, uh, potentially seeing accumulation, especially when we compare it to something like the dollar, especially when we compare it to something like against something like the S&P 500. So price will confirm that thesis, right? That's the thesis we have is that Bitcoin's going higher. Uh, again, not a guarantee, not a recommendation, but that's what price is right now. And so if we see that continue, great. If not, uh, we won't be a part of it. But I would say between that and uh, just knowing that the election is going to be the election and we'll re let price dictate our moves um, and having a game plan for that, right? We're not in the business of predicting. Uh, Ian and I don't know. Paul doesn't know. Those watching this don't know what's going to happen in the election. We don't know what's going to happen in the market but we can have a game plan for it. And that's what we're going to stick with. Yeah. I appreciate the game plan. Our clients uh, appreciate the game plan. Uh, and if you're a prospect that doesn't have a game plan, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to, to do this uh, question and answer panel uh, for education for our, our clients and, and friends of our firm. Uh, Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you got some final thoughts with your presentation and, and we'll look forward to uh, Seeing people again, whether it's on video here or, or in person. So uh, everyone stay healthy and make sure you, you go out and vote. All right, I just have some final thoughts for you guys. Um, as we wrap up this presentation, I think there's been a lot of good information in here. Uh, I appreciate Ian and Paul uh, stepping up and having that Q&A session with me. I think we covered some important topics. Uh, but for me, the final thought I want to leave you with as we head into the election here 
is I'm going to tell a little story about my, my second oldest. I've got four kids. My second oldest, she's in seventh grade. Um, you know, I, I don't typically broadcast my political leanings. Uh, we have a strong belief that, that uh, politics don't play a role in the portfolio, and so it doesn't. Uh, but I do want to tell you a story about uh, about Lydia, and, and she's in class, and the teacher asks, you know, who are you going to vote for? Ask people to raise their hand and be ready to answer why uh, they're going to vote for who they vote for. So she, she raises her hand. The teacher calls on her, and um, just to create answer, I'm not going to tell you who she said she's going to vote for, but her answer on to why she was going to vote for who she was voting for it was basically, despite all the crap that we've been through in 2020, we're still the United States of America. And I thought, you know, from the mouth of babes, right, like just simplicity, absolutely true. We are still the United States of America. Uh, COVID, riots, those things have not broken us. Uh, it's awakened us to different things. Uh, 2020 has been eye-opening in many aspects, whether it's political, whether it's social justice, uh, anything, you, whether it's corruption, you name it, whatever. 2020 has been enlightening, and we are still the United States of America, and I want to leave you guys with that. I also want to talk a little bit about the fact that um, we're always going to stay disciplined to a process. You know, when Lydia talked about still being the United States of, of America, one of the things I guess I want to touch base on is when we think about participating in the republic, participating in democracy and voting, I know the news right now is trying to focus on, oh, we think it's going to be a, a lengthened election, uh, it's not going to be decided right away, and there's going to be riots, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe. But I also know the feeling I got when I voted, because I've already voted, I'm participating in the process, right? Process is important, and we have a, an amazing process to transfer power in the United States. Uh, we have it a presidential election, happens every four years. We have, you know, House of Representatives, Senate elections. We have local governance elections. This is important, and we're part of that process, and we should take pride in the fact that we're participating in that process. And so when I voted, I had this strong sense of whatever the results, right? We're going to accept them because we're part of the process. And as more and more people vote, I think they're going to have the same feeling too. Yes, we're going to have maybe some paid actors that are out there riding the results. But in the end, we're going to respect the results, right? Because that's who we are. We're Americans and we participate in the process. And so that's part of what we do at Adapted too. We focus on the process. We're always going to identify risk versus reward. We're going to invest with the direction of the trend. We're going to manage risk using weight of evidence and position sizing. We're going to stay disciplined to the system and the hard data. And that spells AIMS. That spells the Adaptive Investment Management System. That's what we're going to do for our clients. As I talked about game plan-wise, below 3,400, and just to update you, uh, when we look at uh, where we are currently, we're actually down here now. We have reduced for our clients. If we get below 3,200, uh, we want nothing to do with stocks. That doesn't say we're going to get below 3,200. If we stay in this range here, back here, we'll have some exposure back above 3,400. Uh, we'll have uh, aggressive exposure for our clients. That's our game plan. Not a lot of people do that, and we're pretty transparent. Uh, many people are buy and hold, but for us, below 3,200, we want nothing to do with stocks. Above 3,200, we can participate. Above 3,400, we can be aggressive. And so that's the game plan for our clients. It's not for everybody. That's not a recommendation, but our clients understand what we're doing on their behalf. And so that's once, you know, that's the main point I want to leave you guys with. Participate in the process of voting in the republic, in our democracy. We're going to focus on the process of managing risk, regardless of who's, who's elected. And if that's something that's appealing to you and you're not a client of ours, feel free to reach out to us. You know, if that means uh, calling, if that means using our website, uh, you can do that, clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. You can reach out to us next month, November 18th. We have our best practices on uh, auto, home, and recreation insurance. That's going to be delivered by our expert team on the insurance team of Chris, Carrie, and Steve. I mean, just a ton of industry experience between the three of them. Uh, we love those guys, and they're going to provide great information next week. If you are interested in seeing how adaptive can work for you, how our true holistic process could go to work for you and secure your financial confidence, it's really easy. It's a four-step process. You schedule a no-fee no initial consultation with us. You work with our team, and we customize a true holistic plan for you. 
ongoing. There's ongoing updates, strategy sessions because your life changes. And number four, you're going to enjoy your new financial confidence. So you can call us at 262-335-1700. You can email us at my team at clientfirsttaxnowealth.com. Otherwise, you guys have a great uh, rest of your October and into November. And remember, participate in the process and take pride in being part of that process. Take care.